Greetings. Today is Sunday, the seventeenth of May, and this is the translation of Jacques Peter Smith's message, which is entitled "Philip the Deacon and Simon the Magician." Our reading is taken from the Book of Acts, chapter eight, verses four to twenty-four. Hello, everyone. For this sixth Sunday after Easter. Let's continue our journey in the Acts of the Apostles with the text proposed by the Christian churches in the first reading of their liturgy. This is the story of the evangelization of the city of Samaria by Philip, one of the seven deacons chosen by the community of Jerusalem to serve at the tables. So let's read Acts chapter eight, verses four to twenty-four. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, "This man is rightly called the great power of God." They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, "Give me also this ability, so that every one on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit." Peter answered, "May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money." You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that He may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, "Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me." Chapter eight. Inaugurates a new stage in the construction of the church. This is the stage of the dispersal due to a persecution led by Saul of Tarsus. This persecution begins after the stoning of Stephen, one of the seven deacons in the Jerusalem community, which we read about in chapter seven. While it might have been thought that this step would be a backward step for the church, the reverse is happening as everyone who has left Jerusalem begins to spread the good news wherever they go. This is the case of Philip, who, like Stephen, is a deacon. Chapter eight reports on two evangelistic events led by Philip. First, the evangelization of the city of Samaria, our story. And then the evangelization of the Ethiopian eunuch on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Two things are instructive in this morning's story. First, this story shows us, in another context, what is this table service? You remember this mission entrusted to deacons, so also entrusted to Philip. The novelty is that this table service does not take place in the community of Jerusalem, but in the city of Samaria. Last Sunday, we learned that table service was the ability of the Spirit to speak the word of God in the language of those who hear it. In Samaria, we will see how this service manifests itself. The second instructive thing is that the story shows us the difference between the action of God and the action of magic, because we can confuse them, and Simon demonstrates it to us well. Why would 
curing the lame and casting out demons, which is what Philip does in Samaria, not be acts of magic. We who are believers, of course, don't think that they are. They come from God. But what about the others? In fact, by its organisation, the text forces us to compare what Philip does and what Simon does for our instruction. Let's look at this second point first. How does one distinguish the action of God from an act of magic? And I will carry out this comparison in two steps. We will first look at the effects that the acts of Philip and Simon produce in the city. We will then compare the acts themselves. What are the effects on the city of the acts of Philip and Simon? Let's look at Simon first. A city of high and low people is built around the acts of Simon, verse 10. Everyone, for the least, from the least to the greatest, clung to him and said, This is the power of God, the one who is called the great. And in this city of high and low, Simon is great. He is even the tallest. Simon is the greatest because he performs miracles with his magic and he amazes the people. You could say that Simon imposes himself by his power, and it is imposing because Samaria is a city built on the model of the big and the small. The strong and the weak, the rich and the poor. In short, nothing that we do not already know, where the one who dominates is the powerful, the rich, the intelligent. And this is the case with Simon in Samaria. So much for Simon. If around the acts of Simon a city of high and low people is built, and can be said that around the signs and wonders of Philip is built a city of men and women. Verse 12. But when they believe Philip, who announced the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, men and women were baptised. This distinction between men and women is all the more striking since when Philip arrived in the city, it was crowds who were attached to what Philip said. In verse 6, the crowds were attached to what Philip said when they heard and saw the signs he was performing. In six verses we pass from undifferentiated crowds to men and women who are baptised. Around Simon a world is built which is based on the strength of some and the weakness of others. This is the world we know in which we live. Around Philip a world is built which is based on the gender difference between men and women. You will say to me then, but in the world of Simon, there are also men and women. Yes, of course, but it doesn't matter. In Simon's world, men and women are interchangeable. There is no difference between a man and a woman. Look today at the energy our world spends on erasing this difference. Everything that a man can do can be done by a woman and vice versa. And if this difference is made, it is in terms of weak and strong or small and large. By his action, Philip reveals a world fundamentally built on the difference between men and women. This reminds us, of course, of creation, Eden, where God creates woman because man has not found a helper which corresponds to him by naming all the living beings in the garden. The creation of God is based on this difference. By the signs and wonders of Philip, God creates a city, not of big and small, but of men and women. God creates a city based on love, and this city is called the kingdom of God, or the church. In this story, we are therefore faced with prodigious acts, one for a world of, of big and small, and the other for a world of men and women. The question now is, can we make a difference between these prodigious acts which do not have the same purpose? That is to say, the difference between the acts of Simon and Philip. The answer is not unequivocal. It's yes and no. No when we look at Simon, but yes when we look at the acts themselves. For Simon, there is no difference between all these acts. Simon considers that the signs and wonders of Philip are greater than those he does. Therefore, he believes and is baptised and will even want to buy the power of Peter and John, which is to spread the Holy Spirit. 
Simon's example is very instructive for us Christians because we can look like Simon. We may have started to believe only because God is stronger than others. We may have started to believe only to be always the strongest, never sick, never having to suffer, always healed. Simon is baptised but without being transformed, without having been created from above, without having joined this new people of men and women, without having tasted what love is. We Christians need to be very vigilant because we can easily resemble Simon and delude ourselves by calling love, which is in fact only desire for power. From this point of view, I would gladly say that the COVID-19 crisis is doing us good. No one was spared. Contagion affects everyone. Looking at Simon, Philip and Simon are not differentiable. But when we look at the Acts themselves, Philip and Simon do not do the same thing. The text says nothing about Simon's actions except that they are magical. On the other hand, the text gives some very important information on the signs and wonders that Philip does. In verse 7 we read that Unclean spirits came out of many demons, uttering great cries and many paralysed and lame people were healed. In the book of Acts, not much healing is reported to us, unlike the Gospels. And in physical healing, there are only healings of the paralytic or the lame. In all, there are four, two made by Peter, in Acts 3 and 9, one by Paul, Acts 14, and one by Philip in our text. It's amazing. Weren't there sick people other than the lame? Certainly, yes. But in Acts, the ability to be able to move, therefore to walk, is essential. Without displacement, it's impossible to join the world of men and women, impossible to join the church. It's impossible to join the kingdom of God, impossible to live in love. It is a necessary condition. Otherwise, the human being cannot go on to be baptised. The paralytic, the lame, therefore is, is, represent a major handicap. It's impossible to meet God without being able to walk. Look at Abraham. If he had not been able to walk, he would never have left home to go to the land that God showed him. Abraham leaves to meet love, the bond with others, the world of creation. What was necessary for Abraham is necessary for all of us. Without feet there is no salvation and no love. But that is not enough. Because to experience love, it is not enough to go to meet the other. You must also welcome them, but you can only welcome them if there is room in oneself. This is why Philip chases away unclean spirits to make room so that men and women can welcome those to whom they are going towards. When Philip arrives in Samaria, he gives everyone the ability to go to the other. He gives everyone their ability to receive the other. He breaks down all the barriers that prevent everyone in this city from meeting God, from living love. It is clear that the signs and wonders that Philip does are not acts of power in the manner of Simon. By his signs, Philip only gives back to the people of this city the desire to love one another, the desire to enter the world of men and women, and the desire to leave the world of the small and the great. No wonder it brings joy. In verse 8 we read, And there was great joy in this city. By the acts themselves, it is possible to differentiate between acts of God and magical acts. The acts of God lead to joy because they lead to a world of men and women. The magical acts lead only to amazement. This is another facet of table service. It is a question for Philip of removing the obstacles which prevent men and women from going to God and the others and to receive them. Removing the shackles is a way of speaking the word of God in everyone's language. Let's take an example from Philip in our evangelism work. And with the help of God, let's raise the lame so that they may enter this kingdom made up of men and women for the joy of all.